Just ahead on American Black Journal, the concern over a shortage of minority-owned businesses in Detroit's downtown and midtown districts. We'll look at new efforts to include African-American companies in the city's comeback. Plus, we'll get expert financial and marketing advice for small minority businesses, and we'll show you how food entrepreneurs are getting a helping hand from Eastern Market. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts right now. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Thanks for joining us at our new time. It's been nearly eight months since Detroit emerged from bankruptcy and began its real rebirth. However, there's concern over the declining number of black-owned businesses taking part in that comeback. Some longtime minority business owners say they're being forced out of downtown and midtown through evictions and, and foreclosures. Detroit City Councilwoman Mary Sheffield has issued a resolution calling for policies that promote the inclusion of small minority businesses in Detroit's revitalization. Joining me now to talk about it is Councilmember Sheffield, along with Darnell Small, who's the owner of the Tangerine Lounge, and Eric Williams, who's the director of the Wayne State Law Center. Welcome to American Black Thank Journal. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, on. Councilwoman, I want to start with you okay. and your resolution. Yes. What, what does it say, and what do you think uh, it, it might accomplish? So, um, as I stated before, Council speaks to resolution, and, and we talk a lot about um, the lack of minority businesses within the city of Detroit as we begin the revitalization of the city. So, I thought it was important for us to speak the resolution and let the administration know that this is an issue that we're serious about and that we can no longer uh, be quiet on. And it really speaks to the need for more policies, uh, policies and initiatives and programs that would directly address uh, the, the, the fact that minority businesses in the city are being pushed out. And so we see a lot of programs that are attracting investment in the city to, uh, to attract businesses in Detroit, but not really programs and initiatives and programs to help retain existing businesses in right. the city of Detroit. So we need to call on more intentional policies that directly impact existing minority business here in the city of Detroit. I, I'm going to ask you this just straight out. How much of this is about a market that is getting more expensive mm -hmm. uh, to do business in uh, and how much of it is just about race I think that it's a little bit I don't want really to put the race card in it, but I think that there is market force. Right, <laughs> there, there is market forces, and their people are really are beginning to capitalize on the rebound of this city and yeah. the fact that some existing yes. businesses in the city cannot afford to pay the rent. But how do we, as a city, begin to assist these businesses, making sure that they have access to capital, making sure there's loans available, making sure we have programs in place to help these long-term businesses who've endured through the good and the bad in this city. Right. And so we have they to come together. They stuck it out That's even right. when right. Right. it was tough to be here. Yes, and I think that we have to make. Sure Sure we're able to come together as one and, and create those type of programs to help those businesses right. move forward. Darnell, yours is one of the businesses that faces new challenges uh, about where you are uh, and whether you can stay there. Tell me just quickly w w what's going on and, and what you think is uh, well, behind it. Well, Councilwoman just hit, hit a home <laughs> run, everything she said. She just stole it you know, right out of my <laughs> That's head. That's right, you got nothing accurate. else. <laughs> um, First of all, I, I am gone. It's not facing the challenge. Right. It's, it has happened. It, it happened. Right. Um, and I know people discuss, you know, the expensiveness, you know, of the city. But my situation was, I guess I was surviving even though it was getting expensive. And I saw all the opportunities coming to the city and was waiting. I just never had the opportunity to endure some of the great opportunities, you know, as far as new people opening business, getting qualifying for certain loans and things. But what is important is, it is business if, if, if a person wants to go up on the rent if the long as the lease is over. Mm -hmm. But people capitalizing, as Councilwoman is saying, I mean, we, you know, yeah, you, you can go up on the rent. If, you want, if you're paying $4,000 a month and they want to go up to $40,000 when the lease is over, that's fine. That's business. Right. But trying to gain very quickly. The, the just, ha what happened to you happened outside the terms of. Right, yeah, because we had seven years to start. We had seven years left on the lease and, you know, but, but, but. The thing is, we're, we're, we're out, uh, uh, Stephen. Um, um, they just couldn't wait till the lease was over or didn't want to pay, pay us out to, to get out. You want to pay to get somebody out so you can make progress, fine. Yeah. So, Did you feel like some of it was about them not wanting your business or the type of business yours was in that spot as much as it was about money? 
I think it was both. Um, for one, they want to move their business. You know, they're in the same business. They have a, you know, a brewery. You know, it's at Water Brewery. They were there before us. Right. And it used to be a new, uh, yeah. a old owner. Right. So when they came back and brought the building, they want to move back, which is nothing wrong with that, but just pay the person to move on. You know, all these leases, you wouldn't hear all these people complaining. They're literally getting displaced, you know, illegally, right. you know. And what, what I'm working on is to make sure it never happens to me, but to anybody else. I, I'm, everybody says move on. I am working on some things to try to be placed. I want to be a success story in Detroit. I was here before. If it wasn't for people like me, the, the great things that are being going on in the city, you, you wouldn't have the Dan Gilbert or the Illegis. We sustained the city we, in our small right. part. And nobody else was interested. It's just like if, if everybody, you know, you have tenants in Bedrock. I think it's great. They are full. But if all those tenants just left, you know, that's a problem. You know, and you can come after somebody who leaves lease, so it should work both ways. So I want to have my success story. I'm working on something right now. It's hard. I have been displaced. You know, you can't count me out. But I want to make sure I'm not right back here at the table and the other just, table just, just to happen away. again or yeah. anybody else. Yeah. You know, we just want to make sure it's an even playing field as well. Right. Uh, Eric, I know that you have uh, started a program to try to help uh, small businesses, minority and otherwise, uh, just sort of deal with the challenges of, of being a small business in the city, get started and, and grow. That's really, it's still very, very tough to do right. that. No, it, it certainly is. And part of... Uh, Part of the problem is, of course, capitalization. So right. small businesses in the city face real capitalization problems, in part because uh, if you're starting a small business, your biggest asset that you're going to use as collateral is your home. And yeah. so, of course, right. uh, when, when you're comparing businesses started by people who live in the city versus people who live outside <laughs> in the suburbs. you got real disparity. Yeah, there's a real disparity. So the sub suburban small businesses automatically have an advantage. They have That's access to more, more capital. Right, sim simply by virtue of living outside the city, yeah. right, nothing else. Um, the other problem, of course, is that if you're um, living in a community where you don't have a lot of uh, people in, in your immediate circle who are, you know, lawyers, who are accountants, who have previously run a business, who are familiar with how zoning and permitting operate, uh, you don't have that informal network and you may not be aware of the formal network that would actually help you avoid making a lot of the problem, uh, committing a lot of the mistakes right. that ultimately undermine a lot of small businesses. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and if you're going to change that, then you actually have to have policies in place to do that. You just simply can't talk about it. Right. I, I want to ask this question of, of all three of you. What could African American businesses have done while there was no one else in the city, which was true for a long time, everyone else sort of abandoned us, uh, what things could have been different that would have made it more, well, would have made it more secure for black businesses to stay? We hear about ownership, right? Uh, if you own the building you're in, then you're not dealing with somebody who's uh, jacking up the rent or, or cutting you short on a lease. Uh, if the city is more focused on sustaining black businesses in general, they're in better shape so that when other businesses come in. What, what mistakes did we make inside the community that maybe we ought to, to correct now? Be before we, I, I just want to say, I understand the, the ownership thing, but I'd, I'd like to address that right off the bat. Sure. Because when people talk about uh, black businesses wouldn't have been in this position if they owned the building, what you're saying is, you should have made what everyone else considered to be a really bad investment right. at that time. Right. And Nobody if you else had done wanted that, those buildings. You'd be fine now. And I that's absurd. That's, an that's, just, that's, yeah, a, that's right. a non starter as an argument. And yeah. you hear it time and time again, but I, I just think it's You said that was not that was not a reasonable solution back then. No, it, it certainly wasn't. Yeah. So And it was hard to get closings in, in Detroit to get people to finance people, you know, small to businesses. Get, again, uh, they considered high capital. risk or, 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 or Detroit was a high risk. You know, so, um, I mean, a lot of people uh, who are doing these great things, I mean, that's fine. I'm, I'm not here to stop progress, but you got to realize they got great opportunities by getting right. the buildings for cheap because I guess maybe they can rehab them. But as he says, we, I, I get tired of hearing you should own. So America was built on contracts. In my situation, I'm not trying to drive it down the thing. I've never missed a month's rent. I've never been late. Uh -huh. I was still removed. And then when I was illegally removed, I was awarded the property back. But... In, in theory, but I didn't have my keys for a couple weeks, so it's called a force out. So it's not about, yeah, you should own. I am trying to own as I move forward, but you know, and then those are other opportunities, as he said. It's, it's not easy to say in Detroit, you, somebody's gonna finance this or, you know, for this price. But if you're, if you're, if you're paying a lease, that lease, you're obligated to it. You can't break that lease. 
but it should work both ways. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would just touch go, on go it ahead. and just say that in general, I think um, local businesses, if they had been better at strategic planning and, and really looking at long term, because we know that uh, Detroit was in a situation that it was in only for a short amount of time, sure. and that we were going to eventually rebound, and so that they needed to probably plan a little bit better uh, for this revitalization that we're in, but then also make sure that we're holding our local government accountable well, see, that's and what making I was gonna, sure that there are intentional, again, policies yeah. that are directly helping them for the rebound and revitalization of this city. How, how how agile can city government even be, though, with restrictions like Prop 2, uh, the, the constitutional amendment that says you can't consider race in any sort of uh, government policies? What what can city government do to try to help black businesses? And I'm thinking right now, we have uh, any ideas, we have all of these different programs that are being brought to us right now at council table, but yeah. again, they are only for how do we attract businesses into the city. There right. is not a program that has been put before me that says business. this is for how we can to help existing up, right. businesses that have been here. And we need to have an intentional, again, program or policy or initiatives in place that it says this is for existing minority business to support them and sustaining this, the city of Detroit. What does the Duggan administration uh, say when you talk to them about they, this? They believe that some of the programs that are in place are helping businesses, but again, that's that's an argument that can be made. Yeah. And just really quick on that point, I'm hoping that those conversations we can be, get, begin to have now with okay. this resolution and moving forward. We can't talk around it anymore. Right. We need to really direct Deal direct, with it and direct, for directly, what it is. Yes. And, and us as business, I'm, I'm not of an organization. I am part of the businesses, you know, the, the everyday. Right. Right. So if you want to call that an organization, we appreciate the, the council taking the position that they're taking because it's, it's, it can't keep being overlooked. Right. And, and, and again, we're not saying, ah, oh, these people are coming in the city. We, 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 we're fine with that. We just right. want to be elevated. Wanna, we want to elevate right. too. That's all it, it needs and to that's be. A, that's the challenge. We want the, the same opportunities. We, we want to grow. We want to make people proud of us too. And we've, we've been here knowing Hey, it's going to come back. Believe in it. Right. When people abandon it, but we don't lock us it. out. Yeah, and we, we believed in it before all these things that happened. Yeah. We, we just, just hang in there. We tell each other, it's, hey, come to Detroit. You know, everybody goes to, to the other counties like Somerset, yeah. you know, and Troy and right. Birmingham. But we, we believe in Detroit. Stay so in we Detroit. just, as, yeah. as Councilwoman said, we just felt that we should be elevated at the same time as that. I wish uh, we could talk about this for 21 <laughs> yeah, minutes, but of course, the, we only have 30 minutes in the show, so we're out of time. Thank you all for Thank being here. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Just ahead on American Black Journal, we'll continue our conversation about minority owned businesses with two experts on growth and financing. That's right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1973, Inner Visions by Stevie Wonder was released on Motown Records. In 1976, City Council approved a resolution to change 12th Street to Rosa Parks Boulevard. And in 1984, Bishop P.A. Brooks was elected to serve on the Church of God in Christ board. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history taken from the book on this day, African American Life in Detroit. Earlier this year during National Small Business Week, two experts joined me on the show to talk about the challenges facing minority business owners and how best to overcome them. At the top of the list, funding and marketing. Here's a portion of my interview with Nicole Farmer of Lifeline Business Consulting Services and Mark Lee of The Lee Group. Detroit has always been a city of innovators. And what I'm noticing is that more and more people want to certainly land here and do things, but I think in the same vein, uh, the challenges that we have are very similar. Uh, the number one challenge for all businesses, particularly amongst uh, women and minority-owned businesses, access to capital. Yeah. And that is something that we want to be able to articulate on May the 14th is there are different types of resources out there for you, both the traditional and the non-traditional. So some of the challenges that you may see at large are certainly very similar when it comes to women and minority-owned businesses as well. And access to capital, uh, as Mark says, you've got traditional and non-traditional yes. uh, avenues to, to try to take care of that problem. For minority and women-owned businesses, though, the non-traditional paths are the ones that seem to be growing and uh, sort of expanding and now make it almost so that you don't need that traditional lending sector. It's right? actually a lot easier. I mean, you have different organizations like Kiva, for instance. You need that $5,000 seed, um, and you just need someone like myself to back you. We're there for you just to get you launched so that you can um, start to test your product, to see who likes it. A lot of times we are not feeling very confident about our business mm -hmm. either, and so we really need to start building up our confidence and testing our product with the customers 
customers that we think that would like to purchase our products. And where is the capital coming for these non-traditional uh, sources? Where is that coming from? Well, what I love right now is that there's so many different foundations that are coming together and creating this funding ecosystem. And then um, one, uh, one of our uh, our funders are uh, is actually the Detroit Micro Enterprise Fund, uh, the Detroit Development Fund with the, the Michigan the Women's Development Fund. Fund right, yeah. Yes, with the Michigan Women's Foundation and Huntington Bank has actually provided a twenty-five million dollar loan fund uh -huh. for us, so that we can start to get this money out into the streets, so we can start building our neighborhoods and seeing these entrepreneurs flourish in our neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I talked about the number of minority and women-owned businesses in the in the open. If you just hear those numbers, you would think, well, the city should, the city's economy should be in much better shape and people should have more jobs and more money in their pockets. What's the, what's the disconnect there? I think the disconnect, though, while we have a, a significant number of minority-owned businesses in the city of Detroit, um, people still want to get their messaging out there. The awareness levels of those businesses are, are strong, but they need to become stronger. I think the other challenge that you will see in Detroit, a lot of businesses across all veins of business still fail. There's a lack of success with respect within 18 months. So while the numbers may be high, there's a great level of churn. Right. And we got to figure out the best way to get the information in their hands so they can become sustainable and successful over time. And what's the, what's the main reason that uh, these businesses fail? You know, this is strategic planning. Uh, I, I've all, I'm always an advocate. If you have an idea, I have a lot of people, Steve, who come to me and they approach me and say, Mark, I have a great idea. My first question is, what's your plan? What's your plan? <laughs> yeah, and unless you have that plan, you're not going to be always successful and I think what you have that plan it lays a foundation a direction for you to become successful long term. Right and uh, in your consulting business you, you probably see this all the time. Exactly. People just not prepared. They're not prepared and they don't have a team and so we actually provide accountants for them. We provide lawyers for, for them because a lot of times they cannot technically afford. They don't have that. Sure. Right they don't have that and so now they have not a clue even how to spell the word financial much less understand what a P&L statement is. Right. And so now giving them the tools in their toolbox so that they can fix that car in the proper way, that's what we love to do. Right, right. Uh, I want to talk more generally about Detroit. We are seeing this incredible uh, new private investment of capital yes. in, in certain areas, in downtown yes. and in midtown. Uh, it's starting to trickle out into the neighborhoods, I think, slowly. I think in the next five years we'll see that, that happen. One of the things that people are really concerned with is how many uh, minority and women-owned businesses are getting to participate uh, in that in that rebirth. Uh, I live downtown. Uh, I, I notice as much as anybody uh, that that dearth of of people who look like us uh, who seem to be participating. Uh, what's the answer to that? You know, I, I think that we have to somehow get the message out there across the entire city. Detroit is 139 square miles. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're right, there's a lot of investment, a lot of things happening downtown and midtown. Nothing is wrong with that. I don't want to be, I don't want to misconstrue. <laughs> but I think the, the challenge again, Stephen, is how do we get that information into the neighborhoods? Um, Northwest Detroit, for example, Livernoy Avenue is hot. A lot of investment. No question. Okay, how do we take that investment from Livernois to the other parts of the city? So to answer your question, the challenge is going to continue to be to make sure that people understand the access to capital, understand that we have resources in the city, in the neighborhoods to become successful. we got to figure out how to get that message out there. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, with uh, my consulting firm, Lifeline, we've actually started to go into the churches. Okay. So well, going into the churches and now providing the one-on-one -on -one coaching, providing the consulting, providing these tools so that everyone can get on board right. and understand what the funding is. And so we're actually doing different pop-ups from east, west, north, and south so that everyone can get on board. Right. And so once you start to see that your next door neighbor got some funding, when you start seeing yeah. your next door neighbor's sweet potato pie right. is now <laughs> being placed at different organizations and they're getting great hot um, connections, sure. then now you're ready to jump on board um, the next year. So it's really about confidence. Um, we really don't have the confidence in our city because we've been so depressed yeah, for right. so long. Right. And so once we start seeing our neighbor taking off, then I think that we'll start seeing more individuals taking off as well in the neighborhood. I mean, it sounds from both of you like uh, the focus, uh, your focus is more in the neighborhoods than Definitely. it is downtown Absolutely. in Midtown. but. 
is there a connection between that activity that we see in downtown and midtown uh, and, and the sort of rising economy uh, in those areas and the neighborhoods? I, I think so. I, for instance, I have a client, uh, Miss um, Miss Jones, Ayana Jones. She has a company called Pedicures and Shoes. Okay. She's a young lady, married, several children, um, and she has this brilliant idea of creating bringing pedicures and shoes together and we found her a place downtown. Is that right? So now connecting her to a space downtown, now connecting her with the funding that she needs for a startup, connecting her with the free grants now. So really asking everyone to open up their Rolodex right. and then now let's get this young lady some help. Um, so you're starting to see, in, um, see clients of mine starting to integrate into areas where we really may not feel like we're connected, right. but we're, we are connected. We just have to now have the confidence again to go after our dreams yeah. and turn them into reality. Yeah. And I, I think she makes a good point. You know, um, the grassroots really is important. People think that uh, you have to have a significant marketing budget to start to get your messaging out there. Sure. You know, think about it, for example, um, 35, 32,000 businesses, let's assume they employ five to 10 people. That's 150 that's to 300,000 people evil, employed. Right. Yeah. That's grassroots. If we can get them talking about their businesses, if we can get them going to their neighborhoods, if we can get them using social media, other forms of marketing approaches, if you will, your marketing budget uh, does not have to be that significant. Sure. But the challenge is, is servicing your customer, making sure you're getting your messaging out there, and having people talk about your business. Right. Finally today, Detroit's food entrepreneurs are getting some much needed assistance in growing their businesses. Thanks to a state grant, Eastern Market is helping business owners in the food industry get access to the equipment and ingredients they need to create their products. The program is called Detroit Kitchen Connect. In June 2013, the Eastern Market Corporation received a $1 million grant as part of Governor Rick Snyder's Michigan Community Revitalization Program. Eastern Market used the grant to build Detroit Kitchen Connect and renovate one of the market's sheds. Detroit Kitchen Connect is a program that helps food entrepreneurs overcome the high cost of setting up a commercial kitchen by providing access to commercial licensed kitchen facilities and equipment. Today, Eastern Market and Detroit Kitchen Connect serve as two examples of Detroit's ongoing comeback. There's been an explosion of food entrepreneurs in Detroit, and not just Detroit, but also our region. And that's because this is a location where folks have been able to find support. No one thought that Detroit had any really great anything for a while. We were, we were the, the city on the downslide. We've gone through bankruptcy. Because it was forgotten, people were able to take chances here that they couldn't have taken in other locations. They were really able to start their businesses and grow. I used to make treats for all of my co-workers and they told me that I should start selling them. So I just decided after some soul searching to turn it into a business and that's how Five Star K Company came about. Crim Detropolis was uh, started with my, um, my mother's sweet potato pie recipe. So I started tweaking it and for a couple of Thanksgiving it just got better and better and um, at that point my mother told me that I need to do something with it. Nirvana Tea started right at my kitchen table with my daughter Claudia and myself. It just took on a life of its own. It has the Detroit spirit. This is the place where connection happens. This is where people come to take their grandkids to pick out their Christmas tree. This is the place where you know, a hundred thousand plus people come on a Sunday to buy all their flowers to beautify their yards. This is a place that is um, a where people can come and have long-standing relationships with the people who are making and growing their food. So our farmers and the farm and other parts of the state are coming here during growing season to sell their produce. So now we have entrepreneurs who I've been fortunate to work with who are making their food products by buying the local fruits and vegetables from our farmers, turning those into value-added products, and then selling those at the market, some of them, and then also 
in some of our smaller local retail um, places. And so it's just, it's really cyclical. And when we think about the impact that an Eastern market has on the community, it's, it's vast. And our community isn't just Detroit, it isn't just the Southeast Michigan region, it's the entire state. I am very proud to be a Detroiter, to be from Detroit, um, and to be a part of uh, Detroit's Renaissance. I noticed a lot of the people that have gone away, that spirit of Detroit is still in them, and they're all coming back. Absolutely, Detroit is a good place to start a business. This, this city is on the comeback, so why not now? This is the perfect opportunity. There are, there are grants, there are a plethora of resources to get information to help you along the way. It's the best time to start a business because there are so many people who are willing to help you get off the ground and get going. Absolutely. Detroit is the most awesome place to start a business. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, you can also hear our program on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.